All right, hello everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce Winko, who was with us here this summer to do a BCI project on multi-sensory attention. Uh, Winko is a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon, and he will talk about brain-computer interfaces today. Ooh. <laughs> All right, thank you, Hannes. So uh, my name is Winko. As everyone knows me. Uh, so I've been spending three months on this project uh, in the effort of decoding multisensory attention from electroencephalography, or in short, EEG, and try to think of how to apply that information into a brain-computer interface. So today's agenda is I will start with some introduction of the background, like uh, what is EEG, what is uh, uh, brain-computer interface, or BCI in short. And I will go to the literature review and also my research objectives. And uh, I will talk about my experiment, my equipment, and then how I process and analyze data. And finally, show some results and uh, with, uh, end with a conclusion and future works. So uh, EEG is a measurement of uh, electrical signal. Uh, on, and uh, where does that signal come from? It's from the neurons. So we have millions or two billions of neurons in our brain, and the way that they communicate is, so between each pair of neurons, they have this synapse, and uh, they use some chemical signal at that smaller gap. So whenever there's a signal coming to the synapse, they will release some neurotransmitter, and that signal will be accumulated at the receiving end of the second neuron, and this, the signal will carry on. And uh, for long distance, communication between the neurons or neural networks, uh, the, f the modality of the signal is actually electrical signal. So that's why uh, we can measure some electrical signal along the scalp when we are having some brain activities. So in order to measure some electrical uh, signal from the brain, the, most, uh, the easiest way is to open it up. So <laughs> you ask a neurosurgeon to do a surgery on you, you have this uh, uh, cranial autom uh, autonomy, and uh, you place a sensor there directly onto your brain, and uh, there are some electro uh, electrode arrays, so they can measure the potential change on your scalp, uh, sorry, on your uh, cortex. So uh, with this method, uh, we call it ECOG, electrocortical uh, graphy. So uh, we have very good uh, signal quality, so it's very high uh, signal to noise ratio. And also, because it's electrical signal, so the temporal resolution is pretty high, like it uh, could be a, a few thousands of uh, uh, hertz. And uh, since we know where we put the sensors, the spatial resolution is also very high. Uh, this is workable only if we agree that we want to open it up. Uh, but uh, I guess most of us don't want. So. Uh, an alternative way is to measure the electrical signal along your scalp. So we put electrodes uh, into the, these, uh, we call it EEG caps, and we place them on our scalp, just like a swimming cap. And we put gel uh, into each of those electrodes. So this method is uh, non-invasive. We don't need surgery <laughs> to start with. Uh, the temporal resolution is the same as the previous one, because uh, they are both electrical signals. However, uh, if, you, if you think about that, so in order for the signal to transmit from deeper in the brain to the scalp, it has to go through a couple layers of uh, tissue, brain tissues, and also the scalp and the skull. So all of them form, uh, form a low-pass filter. So the spatial resolution is not great. It's in a centimeter level or a few centimeters. And also, all of these tissues add extra noise to the signal. Uh, there could be some endogenous like circulation or some function controlling our breath. So, which means the signal to noise ratio for EEG is pretty low. Well, depending on what kind of signal you are looking for, uh, for the one that I was working with, it's even lower than zero dB, which means uh, the signal is actually weaker than the noise. So, what we do usually for uh, for for a neuroscience study is to uh, meet thinking about this uh, low signal to noise ratio, uh, single trial doesn't mean anything to neuroscience study because we may hardly see anything on single trial level. Uh, the way we do neuroscience with EEG is to collect uh, 
multiple trials of a single condition and take the average of them with the assumption that the, any brain signal corresponding to this st stimuli is actually time-locked. So if we take the average of all the trials we have, then probably the noise will cancel out each other and, st and the signal itself will stand out. And uh, an alternative way of uh, collecting EEG data, as you can imagine, so the whole brain is a, is a conductor. And if we can measure the signal here, probably we can also measure the signal here. So an alternative way is to place some inner electrodes uh, with uh, conductive materials uh, con contacting your ear canal. And here, probably some signal will transmit from the brain to here and could be captured by this uh, inner EEG electrode. And uh, there are a lot of uh, advantages of using that. Uh, for example, it is unobtrusive, just like an earplug. And uh, also, every time you put it in, it's at the same spot. Uh, comparing to the surface EEG, I mean, it, depending on how you place the, the, the cap, the, 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 the electrical position may actually change from time to time. But for this one, it's very consistent across sessions. However, the signal-to-noise ratio is even lower in this case. And uh, uh, since we only have a pair of ears, so there are only two sensors we can use, uh, compared to the previous option for the surface EEG, we can have 24, 64, or even 256 channels. So uh, we lose those special information when using in inner EEG electrodes. So how does it relate it? How is that related to BCI? So brain computer interface, by definition, is a communication or control system that allows real-time interaction between our brain and any device we have. So here the keyword is real time, which means we have to operate on single trial level instead of collecting multiple trials and take the average. And uh, there are already several applications of uh, BCI systems. So for example, the ECOG could be used in surgery, like neurosurgery, uh, for, medical, for medical purposes. And also it can monitor, I mean EEG can monitor our stress level or emotion change over time. And uh, our focus is uh, this interactive component of the BCI. Uh, we want to communicate with any device we have. We want to translate what we think into an action or a message. So there are already some applications in this uh, field of study. For example, uh, to use your mind to control a wheelchair to go forward or turn. Or turn. Or there are some uh, interesting studies to use EEG to play a game, to control the, per, uh, the soldier to move in the field. So these are the interesting uh, uh, previous uh, BCI projects that we uh, already have. And uh, in terms of what kind of pr paradigm we are using for, e for BCI, uh, here is a summary of the existing ones. So the most popular two are using mo motor imagery and uh, some external uh, stimula uh, stimulation. So motor imagery means uh, you, you, you try to imagine the movement of your body parts. For example, you sit here or stand here without really moving. You think about you're your moving your hand. And that will generate some mu signal or uh, some, mu, uh, some power decrease in mu band, which is around uh, 12 hertz, 8 to 12 hertz. And uh, that could be captured uh, by the EEG, and we can use it to, to control uh, to control system. And uh, the performance of this one is pretty good. Uh, so uh, at the last column, uh, there is a, a information transfer rate uh, in the unit of beats per minute. It means how, how much information you can transfer to the system within one minute. And for this motor imagery one, it could be as high as 20 bits per minute. Um, however, the, the weakness of this motor imagery paradigm is it needs weeks or even months of training before you can really use it. Just think about it. If I ask you to pay attention to your left hand and try to imagine it's, it's, it's moving, how, how hard you can do that? I mean, how faithful you think you are really thinking about it instead of just, uh, you know, just some 
with some random styles or whatever. So uh, it, it really takes efforts to in order to use this one, um, which makes it a little painful to 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 be applied. Uh, another one is to consider uh, it's also in under the category of motor imagery, so where people try to imagine the continuous movement of one single body part. For example, you, can, you think about you're moving your hand, and that information, if could be interpreted by the BCI, could be used for cursor control, for example. You can think about you're you are moving your mouse in your mind, and the cursor could move according to your, to your mind. Uh, however, the performance of this uh, paradigm is only uh, good in, e in ECOG. Uh, in EEG signal, th there's very poor decoding, uh, and we, we don't have actual some, uh, uh, some actual uh, ITR information available for EEG. And for the paradigm that we are using, ex external simulations, uh, a huge amount of work actually focus on using visual stimuli. And the reason is because our cortex uh, is sensitive to visual input, so the visual response is actually much stronger than the others, and uh, and we can use, for example, uh, steady state visual evoked potential where we present some flickering objects, and if you stare, we can place several flickering objects in the field, and you and they can flick, uh, flicker at different frequencies, and you can stare at one of them, and that kind of information, the frequency information, could be shown at the back of your uh, uh, brain. So we can place some sensor there and try to extract, extract that frequency information to decide which one you are paying attention to. And we can also use some, uh, some paradigm called Visual P300, where uh, we, we already know that there are some uh, certain type of brain signal corresponding to the presence of some e infrequent events. For example, if I give you a string of green objects and all of a sudden I give you a red one, the response corresponding to that red one is an inf infrequent event. And that waveform could be captured to use in BCI applications. And uh, the, good, the, the advantage of using visual attention is uh, the, the the performance is pretty good, like could be uh, comparable to the motor imagery, and we don't need training. So you can, if I ask you to stare at one point, you, you don't need extra training to do that. However, uh, there might be some fatigue due to the flickering. If you stare at one point, it's just uh, flashes, and uh, you'll be easily tired after a while. And also, uh, if you want to use your visual world to do some other tasks, uh, in this kind of visual-based paradigm, you're not able to do that. So um, there are also some work corresponding to these uh, other sensory, uh, for example, auditory, uh, auditory uh, using some auditory stimuli. stimuli uh, and here, people apply similar uh, uh, concepts as in the steady state visual evoked potential they, they pay attention to a pure tone with a certain frequency, and uh, just by attending to that frequency, uh, your brain response uh, at that particular modulation frequency will be increased, and we can detect that in the EEG signal. However, this is not very reliable and is not uh, common, commonly used, and uh, based on the previous works, the average or even the best result could be 1.5, which is one twentieth of what the other modality could offer, and the same goes for the using tactile like vibration as the stimuli. The performance is also very low. Um, however, uh, in this project, uh, my focus is on the last two. So, <laughs> um, yes. So I have to think about some clever ways to to make it more engaging or to make it easier for the subject. To, and uh, also easier for the BCI system to decode. So let's see what happened. So as I said, the, one of my research objectives is to use uh, audio or tactile stimuli to build a BCI system that is functional. And uh, also, 
uh, since for a lot of the paradigms that I introduced, they are using steady state responses, which means you play a certain, uh, uh, for example, audit auditory uh, stimuli at a certain frequency, which is pure tone, uh, and you just passively sit there, try to pay attention to that. Uh, I think maybe there are some better ways, for example, if we can integrate is some interactive ba task-based paradigm to the BCI system and see how uh, the engagement, the, the increased uh, in engagement of subjects could help the BCI to decode our brain signal. And the lastly, is if the first one actually works, uh, we want to compare whether uh, if there's any difference when we're using audio or tactile stimuli. So uh, here are some literature review. Uh, the first part is about decoding auditory attention. So when we are paying a attention to different auditory objects in the, in the world, uh, we can use different cues. For example, we can use, if we know where the sound is, we can use our special attention. We can narrow down our attentional span just to that narrow uh, direction. And in order to do that, uh, we, so our brain elicits uh, so some alpha power and uh, if we are paying attention to our left side, the ipsilateral, which is the left side of your brain, will have some increased power, increased alpha power. And the same, uh, I mean, uh, and when you are paying attention to the, to the right, the right side alpha power will also be increased. And here's some uh, unpublished work of my thesis project. And uh, uh, this is the average of uh, like 30 subjects and over uh, around 40 trials per condition that have multiple conditions, which is, uh, this is the average of a huge number of data that, that, that I had. And that would give us a very beautiful pattern in that. But on single trial level, it is not very faithful. And here is some uh, functional MRI work. So we can see deeper in the brain, and we know exactly where the effect is. And actually, when you are paying a spatial attention, the parietal lobe of your, of your brain as well as some um, sensory motor. This is actually pre-central sulcus. It's a little bit uh, in front of your central, your center line here, uh, will be activated when you are paying special attention. And also for the steady state response, uh, there was also a work uh, which, is, uh, which nicely shows this uh, increase. This is a, a attention modulation in, uh, um, in ASSR. So when you are paying attention to, for example, in this case, it's uh, 37 hertz pure tone. Uh, the, 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 37 compo the 37 hertz components in your EEG signal will be, will, be, will be higher than when you are not paying attention to that. And the same for the, when you are paying attention to 43 hertz. However, this is also an average of 10 subjects over like several minutes of recordings. So on the other hand, uh, if we use tactile, the vibration as the stimuli, what would happen? Uh, so there was a study when they, we, they applied a vibration at fingers of the subjects so that they, they were holding this vibrator in their hand. And, uh, they were, and the vibrators were uh, vibrating at different frequencies and they were instructed to pay attention to either left or right. And uh, the result shows that when you are paying attention to for example, 21 hertz in this case, uh, the, the, the power of 21 hertz at a particular electrode will go up. And the same for if, when you are paying attention to the 18 hertz one. Uh, and uh, the effect shows uh, it is mostly located at uh, the parietal lobe and also the frontal lobe. Uh, and again, this is the, the result, uh, which is the average of like 16 second trial over uh, 40 trials. So in, in summary, all of these evidences in the EEG signal are actually very weak on uh, single trial level. We can see those effects on average level, but if we can want to do some real time stuff, uh, using each one of them alone may not give us some very good results. And that could possibly explain why the, in, the uh, information transfer rate is very low for these two types of studies. And uh, so with those in mind, I want to introduce 
my work or my uh, idea on how we can improve it. So in most of the previous studies, we asked the subject to sit there, listen to the pure tone, and they, there are two different frequencies being played. They are woo, and you try to pay attention to that. That's the only task that they have to do. Uh, I feel like, well, at least for me, because uh, I've been working on EEG for, for a while, I've been subject for other studies multiple times. And if I'm the subject sitting there, it's very easy for me to lose attention. Like after maybe the first second or, t or so, I can focus on the sound. But after two seconds, my attention just wandering around, just jumping back and forth between the two stimuli. So I feel like um, there must be some better ways that we can engage our subject. For example, if we can embed some tasks in the, in the whole experiment, we, we require a response for, from our subject. Maybe they are, uh, they are pressured to, to pay more attention and, and may, maybe we can use that to decode whether they are paying attention to left or right. And also, uh, in order to embed a task, we have to have better stimuli design. For example, if I just play a pure tone, there's no task, there's no way we can embed a task in that pure tone. Uh, so we need to think about a way to design our stimuli better so that it can carry some uh, more com complex stimuli features, and uh, it may also be easy for our subjects to focus. And uh, so here's my design in general. So I will use modulated signal uh, because it has been shown to be a key feature for a steady state audio and the tactile studies. And uh, I used mo modulated signal to create a stream of musical notes or vibrations, pulses. So, and uh, I can change the carrier frequency in the middle of the stream so that I can form some patterns of the, of the for example, in audio, it's, it's just like melodies, like do, 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 do. So you can have some more complex feature in the acoustics. And we can spatialize the sound and, and the vibration and, uh, for example, I can play different sound through two different earphones and also play different vibrations on your uh, two wrists. And uh, in, in terms of the, the, interact, the, 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 the interactive component of this uh, whole experiment, I asked the subject to focus on one stream. And uh, later I asked the subject to respond with what, what is a pattern of that attended stream. So this is a general idea, how I engage the subjects with a sort of a game-like design. So here is a brief introduction of uh, what stimuli I use. So I use modulated signal. And uh, for the left stream, it's always uh, with a modulation frequency at 37 hertz. And uh, the carrier actually may change depending on, uh, it may change in the middle of the stream. And uh, the left stream is always uh, is always longer. I mean, in terms of each, uh, each each note, so the left stream is always uh, 400 milliseconds, and uh, the right one is always with higher modulation frequency uh, and with a shorter length. So they may sound something like this. So this is the left stream when the pattern of the melody is going up and stays there. And uh, for the other stream, so it's shorter, so it feels quicker, and uh, it's, it has lower carrier frequency, and uh, it, the, the carrier frequency actually goes up and comes back, so it's a zigzag in pattern. And uh, I can play them together. And the instruction is to pay attention to either left of that, the left stream or the right stream, and try to figure out the pattern of that particular uh, attended stream. So without specialization, it's really hard for someone. Uh, but with specialization, it's actually a pretty easy job. Uh, as an analogous to the audio, 
uh, stimuli. We also have tactile stimuli, uh, which has the exact uh, temporal feature. So the length of the left stream and the right are always matching uh, with the audio stimuli. And uh, the, the difference would be the modulation frequency and the carrier frequency. And here, uh, since our, our hand or our wrist is not very sensitive to the carrier frequency when they are going up or down, we may feel a change in the carrier frequency. So the task is not to identify an up or down pattern. Here is just a switch, which means it, go, it changes and stays there, or it changes and comes back. So, and we can combine the two together when we are playing the audio and uh, also playing the vibration together. And we can synchronize the onset of those notes and the uh, vibration uh, uh, pulses. And uh, the subject could choose to pay attention to more to the sound or more to the vibration or together to both of them. And the, the initial idea is that the vibration may help us to focus better because, uh, uh, well, there, there's a complexity in our nerves that, I mean, neural nerves and also the tactile ones, uh, they may fuse at some higher level. Uh, however, uh, according to our feedbacks, uh, it's not the case during the experiment because people may be distracted by the tactile vibration. And unfortunately, it's just like a divided attention rather than a selective attention. And uh, for the overall of the experiment, uh, we have three different uh, modalities. So auditory alone, tactile alone, or mixed. And we have three different conditions. So attention left, attention right, or no attention. So we can do some three-way classification. And we have 24 trials per condition. And the, the order of those are randomized. And for each trial, we have eight seconds, which give us a total of around half an hour or even more. So for each trial, in the very beginning, I present a visual cue to tell people which way to pay attention. So it could be left, right, or no attention. And after one second, those cues disappear on the screen and becomes a dot. And the subject should focus on that dot. And then after half a second, I start to play the sound or vibration or both, both of them. And uh, here is the period when the subject pay attention, try to identify the pattern of the stream. And after half a second uh, of the, the offset of the stimuli, uh, the subject was uh, instructed to give an answer uh, by using the keyboard. And uh, after another half second, we will present a feedback being a green dot, which means you got it correct, or it's a red one, means you got it wrong. So you know. The answer of what? Mm -hmm. The answer of what? The answer of the, the, the pattern that you are paying attention to. So there are two streams going on, and they have different patterns. So you tell the subject, pay attention on the left? Yeah, so in the very beginning. And so, then you, at the end, you ask him or her to tell you that he paid attention on the left? No, the, the pattern of the stream happening on the left. It could be going oh, up I or see. down or zigzag. So it's just, just a way of, of measuring how, how, bad, how, how, how well they are paying attention to the stream or not. And so there are some uh, possible uh, neural signatures we can find in the EEG signal. So for example, as I said, uh, if, there are, if the subjects were using special attention, we may expect some parietal lobe alpha power increase. And uh, if they are paying attention to the stimuli itself, for example, for sound, there may be some steady state auditory response. And if, for the tactile one, if they are paying more attention to the, the, the vibration, there will be some uh, somatosensory steady state response. And if, you, if they pay attention more to the timing of the onset of the outball, there may be some P300. So we don't control for that. We give the freedom to the subject to do whatever they want, using whatever f strategy they want to focus better on that stream. And uh, I kind of hope that this could uh, make it much easier for them to do the task and also may give us better uh, responses in, in the decoding. 
So the EEG measurement uh, system that we are using is uh, uh, Mbrin Chain Smarting, and uh, it has 24 channels, uh, which is also gel-based. So we place gel every time we use the system. And the sampling rate was uh, 500 hertz. And uh, in the meantime, we also use these uh, in-ear electrodes, uh, which is made uh, in-house by our uh, hardware team. And we put the conductive cloth on the ear tips, so they directly contact our, our ear canal. And the sampling rate was uh, 250 hertz. And uh, in terms of the vibration, uh, we use a vibral uh, tactile actuator, which is, in essence, is just like an uh, audio speaker, but it has a lot of power. So uh, you can feel the vibration when you are uh, using it. And uh, some are smiling because uh, <laughs> the, 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 it's kind of hard for the subject to feel the difference in the vibration. And uh, it could be shown uh, later in the behavioral results. And this is the overall setup. And uh, so we collected data from 12 subjects, and, uh, and uh, we used the 24-channel uh, EEG system with the in-ear electrodes, and we play vibrations through this, uh, this uh, uh, actuator, which we use a bandage to attach to the wrist. And in this, we can free the subject from using their hand when they want to do some task, which may have better application usage when you, we want to move on to the real life BCI application. So we got the data. Uh, how did we analyze it? Uh, we got the raw EEG and uh, we do some simple bandpass filter. And uh, we epoch those uh, continuous EEG signals into different fragments using the onset of the stimuli. So we give this uh, 4.1 second window and chop them out and uh, to use it as a feature that we want uh, for further analysis. And uh, we reject several epochs based on their uh, maximum value because sometimes the, the signal may not be very reliable. They may go off charts. So uh, we can remove those from further analysis. And uh, for the EEG, for surface EEG, we use uh, the independent component analysis or ICA, which is the standard, uh, standard way of using, uh, of removing eye blinks from the EEG signal. And after ICA, we got this pre-processed EEG, which is supposed to be clean. Uh, and then we calculate the spectral power of, uh, of each segment uh, using a three second window with 90% overlapping. And that becomes the feature that we use to train and test uh, this uh, LDA model for classification. And for classification, we use a three-way, three-way, and uh, we, because we have three different conditions, and we use uh, we did the classification for each modalities uh, individually. And here I'm using this eight-fold cross validation with uh, uh, a thousand times. So I first divide the whole. Uh, trials we have, the, the, the whole data set we have into eight-fold and use seven or eight of them to test, uh, to, to train the model and use the other one for testing. And uh, after 1,000 times, we, it can give us a, a trial-level classification result. So results, what do we have? Um, so as I said, this is the behavioral uh, performance. And uh, each column represents each uh, modality, and each line represents a single uh, each subject. And uh, we can see obviously the tactile task is really hard. So everyone uh, got some uh, lower than the other two results for the behavioral. So it's really hard for them to identify the pattern in, on a tactile, maybe because uh, this uh, this. Uh, the wrist is not very, very sensitive to those frequencies, so it's, it's really hard to tell. And uh, yeah, so for the EEG, when we are trying to decode attention, uh, we we got these uh, very interesting results. So 
first of all, uh, the same uh, layout here. So each column represents each modality, and each dot and each line represents each subject. And we can see uh, the average of the three modalities are actually comparable. And a lot of subjects are actually, so here, since we are using a, th a three-way classification, the, the absolute chance floor is one-third. Uh, however, since we suffer from this uh, small sample problem, we cannot claim that uh, our decoding is above chance if it's uh, higher than one-third. Uh, we don't have infinite number of samples to support that. So there was a paper uh, to tell us how to calculate the, the significant chance floor, uh, which is a function of how many classes we have and how many uh, samples we have. And for our particular study, the significant chance floor is 43.1%, which is the dash line here. So we can see uh, there might be three or four subjects uh, whose EG data is not really classifiable. Uh, uh, and uh, it tends to be consistent across different modalities. Uh, however, we got some amazing results for some subjects. Uh, for example, for this red one, it's above 80 for all three modalities. And it is a three-way classification. So uh, the, the information transfer rate could be as high as um, close to uh, I mean more than 15 uh, bits per minute, which is actually comparable to other like uh, visual-based paradigms even. And uh, here is the results by modality, and I can also arrange the results by subject and sort it then based on their maximum decoding. And uh, for the, the ones at the, at the, at the bottom, uh, you know, <laughs> um, it's really hard to classify uh, whether they're paying attention to left, right, or no attention. And it seems to be consistent across different modalities. And uh, for those who could score high in, in one of the modalities, the classification score is supposed to be also high for the other two. So we have this uh, within subject consistency uh, in terms of what kind of uh, modality you're using. Yeah. For those subjects, have you checked the noise levels or SNR? Whether, what was the issue? Uh, we can go to what is the issue later. But for the uh, noise level, uh, there's a way to, to, to control for the noise by uh, measuring the impedance of the electrodes uh, before we start, the, start the, uh, the whole experiment. So we place gel in until we we, we guarantee that every single sensor is actually working, okay. and the impedance is below 10 kilo ohm. 10 kilo ohm. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, the noise should be comparable. comparable. Yeah. OK, so and uh, some may wonder, uh, does the behavioral re results, like how good we can perform in, that, uh, in those tasks, correlate with the uh, classification results? Uh, I thought about that too, but uh, it's really not the case. So, for example, for some, uh, so here's a plot of uh, each dot is an individual subject, and uh, the x axis is their behavioral accuracy in, in terms of how they can, uh, how, how many trials they can get it right out of the, all the trials they have, and the y axis is the classification, which is how well the, the, the model is working. Uh, it's not linear. And uh, it might be nonlinear correlation, but uh, it's really hard to tell. And uh, especially for, for example, in tactile, at this particular behavioral accuracy, we have very contrasting classification, like one is even close to chance and the other is 90%. So it's really hard to make any sense out of this uh, kind of correlation. So um, I would say the relationship between these two are actually very weak. And uh, so a quick summary, uh, we found that actually the, the tactile attention part is really very hard compared to the others. And uh, the, attend, uh, the attention decoding uh, tends to be, tend to vary a, a lot across different subjects. But within subject, they are very consistent across different modalities. So if you do well in tactile, you also do well in the sound or in, in the mixture of those. Uh, and as I said, 
as I said, the relationship between the behavioral and the classification is not very predictable. And I uh, also wonder uh, if the subjects are really paying attention throughout the whole trial, because we have a four second task. So uh, I want to eliminate the, the possibility that some subject may lose attention over time. And uh, yeah, so here's the result and pull and I'm showing the average uh, of all the samples at the same time window that I use. So basically, I, I, I did decoding at each time point and average all the samples from that time point together and show this trace. So this is the two second window after the onset of the stimuli. Uh, it turns out the decoding across time is kind of uh, stable within the subject. We don't see a very clear job. Uh, maybe in particular subjects, yes. Uh, the decoding tends to drop after a while, but uh, it's not the case for most of the subjects. So I guess this is a kind of a measurement of how, or evaluation of how our subjects is paying attention or get engaged during the whole uh, trial. And uh, another interesting question would be, so if I come here today, I do the task, I have derived this model, if I come tomorrow or a week later, can I use the same model on the new data to classify if I'm attending to left or right? So this is the sort of uh, robustness across time. And uh, we ask a few subjects to come back again after one week and to do the same task with a, random, a different uh, order of the trials. And uh, here I'm showing this particular subject who did, uh, who's EEG is very classifiable, and uh, this is the results for training and testing on the same session. And here, uh, this, the same for the second session. And the last column is showing the results when I train on one session and test on the other, and vice versa. So it turns out, uh, for this subject at least, so using a different day, uh, I mean, using different days' data to train the model could also predict pretty well on the second day's data, and vice versa. And uh, the, here's the result for another subject. And uh, it, it's, it's uh, classifiable because everything is above chance, but not as good as 80%. And uh, the same thing happened again in the second session. And if we use the cross-session uh, uh, data to, to, to validate, uh, we found, well, it tends to stay at roughly the same level. There's a, there's a drop in the mixture, or in, in the mixed uh, modalities. Probably the subject was using different strategies when uh, he or she was doing the task. And here is another s subject whose EG data it was not very uh, classifiable in the first session. And uh, it wasn't very classifiable again for the second one. And the cross session validation also shows like it's barely classifiable. And what does it tell us? So if I put them together, you will see, so if someone's data is classifiable in one session, it's tend to be, it, ten it tends to stay at the same after a week. And uh, uh, which means if the model we did derive at one session, uh, it could be used for some subject if they, their data is already classifiable. And uh, it is not the case if they are not. So here's the summary of uh, this section. So the decoding accuracy tends to be stable throughout the whole trial, so the people already uh, paying attention throughout the whole uh, four seconds. And uh, the, the model that we trained uh, within one session could be used in a multi-day uh, visit. And uh, also the, the performance of the classifier is kind, kind of consistent across multi-day within each subject. And next, I'm interested to know what kind of features contribute to that classification. So are they really physiological relevant features or they're just simply some noise or artifacts. 
So here I'm using a neighborhood a component analysis to calculate the feature uh, contribution to the classification. So this is basically a feature selection algorithm. And uh, I can pull, I can take an average of all the features in alpha band for this particular subject and uh, render it uh, on this uh, head model. And as we expected, the Pareto alpha is uh, contributing more to the classification, which uh, follows our previous uh, expectation. And we can do the same for cross-day validation. So here is the result for this particular subject. And uh, I put the multi-session, multi-day session side-by-side uh, uh, -side for comparison. Uh, and I extract features from the modulation frequency of the audio uh, signal and uh, the mo modulation frequency of the tactile uh, vibration and also up the alpha band that we were looking for. And uh, we can see the weight distribution across different sessions are roughly comparable. Uh, for example, in the alpha band, it's always the parietal region. And for the audio, there could be some in the frontal lobe and some in the temporal lobe. And for the, for the tactile, it's, uh, it's also somewhere as we expected. If we compare this, that one to this uh, previous study, this is the overall uh, results of uh, multiple subjects. And we can see that actually on single trial level for the uh, feature selection. So um, it gives us some evidence to, to believe that uh, what, what we are classifying with is actually the, some physio, uh, neurophysio, neuro, ne neurological relevant uh, features. It's not just uh, uh, artifacts or other noise. And the feature weights are kind of uh, similar across multi-day multi sessions, which means uh, the, the, the set of uh, features we, we get from the first day session could be also be used in the second day. So that was the results for the surface EEG. Uh, we also measured the near EEG. Uh, and here is the preprocessing and analysis pipeline. So the only difference between this and the surface EEG is the missing of the ICA uh, component because we only have two channels here. We did the same kind of analysis, and uh, here's the result for the classification. Um, it's much lower than what uh, the surface EEG is offering. So a lot of uh, the classifications are actually around chance floor. But a very interesting observation is the classification for tactile is actually seemingly better than the other two. And I can pull uh, the results for each subject together. And uh, this is the same ordering as we did before. Uh, if you can remember in the previous plot, this is for the surface EEG, the ones on the left is very high in classification. In this plot, it seems to be the opposite. Like the one, uh, the data that, it, that was not classifiable for the surface EEG tends to be more classifiable in the inner EEG. Now we can take a subtraction be between the two and we can see actually some, subject, some subjects in their EEG outperforms their surface EEG. And this is a very interesting uh, observation. And uh, it could be partially uh, explained by how, the, uh, how our brain actually f folds. So there are a lot of dryers and sulcus in our brain. And the structure of our brain defines uh, whenever there is a source in the brain, in which direction the dipole is, uh, is pointing. Just imagine there's a battery there in, in your brain. And it could, fo it could point to different directions depending on how your, your brain is folded. So uh, maybe in some subjects, that dipole or that battery is pointing to somewhere parallel to the surface. So the signal on the surface is not actually great for identifying which way he or she is uh, paying attention. But that may point directly to the inner 
uh, inner electrodes. So the capture, uh, I mean, the information could be captured by the inner electrodes. Of course, this is just uh, one speculation. Uh, we need, of course, need further analysis to, to confirm it. So the summary for this section, uh, yes, the, the classification results for inner EEG tends to be lower than that of the surface for most of the subjects. Uh, and we saw this uh, negatively correlated trend between inner and uh, surface EEGs. So what we learned from this uh, project, so first of all, to integrate uh, auditory and, and, and uh, tactile stimuli into a more interactive task-based paradigm is actually workable, at least as shown in our data. And uh, the results of our, uh, in terms of the uh, in information transfer rate is actually compar may be com comparable to some of the visual-based systems. And it's much better than what, uh, pre what was pre uh, pre previously done. So the performance of the proposed BCI system, uh, as I said, may outperform some previous studies and uh, it's comparable across different uh, sensory modalities. So uh, it could be similar when you're using a tactile or using an audio stimuli. And uh, the performance actually varies a lot across subjects. And uh, uh, that could be explained by some the an anatomical structures uh, uh, in different uh, subjects. And uh, the performance of the BCI system tends to be robust over time, uh, which is the, the result of the cross-validation over a multi-day visit. And we found this uh, interesting negative correlation between inner EEG and surface EEG. So in the future, we can do a lot of things to, to investigate what's going on and how we can improve this BCI system. So we can do some feature redu uh, dimensionality reduction uh, by feature selection. And uh, we can use neural net. In, in fact, actually, we already tried uh, to use a neural net with a already existing structure to try to do the classification. And, but the result is uh, varying uh, across different subjects. For some subjects, there's a huge increase in the decoding accuracy. But for some, it's just like a slightly or even lower than the uh, simple LDA. So we need more time to work on that end. And we can try to integrate spatial information into classification because we have this nicely uh, distributed EEG, 24-channel uh, EEG. So maybe the spatial information of each sensor could tell us more. And uh, we can work on the individual differences to explain what's going on for each different subject. And uh, of course, in, our, in my paradigm, I'm all, only using some simple modulated signal. Uh, there might be some better tasks or, or even game designs to, to, to better the stimuli. So that's also what we can work on. I want to thank all of you guys, uh, Hannes, for the, all the help uh, and, that I received, um, especially on signal processing. And uh, you are a very nice and a caring mentor. Uh, thank you for being there. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank a Casey, uh, who might or might not uh, on the camp now. So uh, he joined the team uh, in the middle of the project, but he contributed a lot in providing very insightful ideas about what we should do, what we shouldn't for the BCI project. And Nick and Hakim, uh, we work on the BCI together, and uh, we collected data and uh, all together. And uh, for Nick, we even share Uber Eats together. So <laughs> it's a very nice experience. And we want to, I want to thank uh, Ivan for giving me the opportunity to share, to study, to learn, and to contribute. And uh, David, Sebastian, and Dimitra, they helped me with hardware or software aspects of my project um, a lot. And also organizing the whole uh, event, like in Bembridge, which is very memorable. And uh, I want to thank our, our teams, uh, Becky and John. SK helped me a lot in the building the whole uh, vibration uh, system and also to testing uh, different EEG systems. And uh, Teresa, Todd, and Patrick contributed a lot to the, heart, to the me mechanical part of my project. And the other, uh, Christian, Andy, 
Ed, uh, Mihai, and Mike in the in the BCI team. Uh, Mike helped me to figure out what kind of uh, vibro tactile uh, actuator I should use. I want to thank uh, all the other interns in our team: uh, Raymond, Tanzid, Ben, Fabian, uh, Sahar, and Elisa, Morel, uh, Rindon. So for um, all the support, I can't say what kind of support, but uh, all the support. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, Ziki for taking me home every night, uh, driving me home. So, <laughs> And a special thanks to my wife, uh, Lindsay, who is uh, in Boston along with my daughter. Um, I can't do anything without her support. So thank you very much, and uh, I welcome any questions. Raymond. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I, have, uh, I just, I just, <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, I just realized it's a three class. Because mm -hmm. um, when I was doing the experiment, I was treating it as a two class, left or right. And when you said no attention, I was just trying left, right, or something else. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, um, Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. actually, if it is randomized, like you, you, you didn't pick one side all the time, it uh, should be fine for this kind of stuff. Yeah, I think it's yeah. randomized. Yeah. Uh, actually, we should not disclose that information, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So just uh, for what? So are you planning to try also to make the difference between left and right? Because if I notice like you did left and no attention, right, no attention, did you do also left versus right for every condition? That? Yeah, like in here. So this is a binary classification between each pair of the conditions, attention oh. left or right. And uh, well, it, the results are comparable to three-way. I think in general, this is 60 something. Uh, which might even better than the three-way, uh, but this is a binary, so okay, yeah. the binary 60 is not compared to 60. And uh, have you also uh, asked the participants what strategies they use? Maybe you can figure out what good strategy uh, can have good, results? Good thought. We didn't do that, though. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe. maybe. We'll do it to and find if you can correlate uh, the good performance with the Yes, strategy. yes, yes. Yeah. That, that could be a, a, a good way to to to, 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 to yeah. deep. Yeah, to go deeper on the individual differences. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, have you tried to fuse uh, surface and linear electrodes well, and use the data together? Not, not really. Um, because uh, I personally trusted the surface EG more because we have a good control of the the, the, the noise, as I said, we have this impedance uh, measurement. For in-ear, we also have one, but uh, it's, it's not very reliable all the time. So if I fuse them, there would be like different noise level for two different uh, like yeah. kind of signal. So I, I was hesitating about doing that. But uh, sure, uh, because we, we've seen those yeah, that comp compensating yeah. patterns, yeah. so maybe that's the signal is, 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 is being captured better in one than the other. So. Yeah. so uh from your experience, uh if so the same people have given different sorts of traffic tasks, so should the class we accurate accurate maintenance or like it varies also like Well what we are saying uh, like people are given given another type type of attention task and then should it vary between the sound signal haptic and those tasks? Like if I'm playing a game. Mm. For, for that, uh, I'm not so sure, actually, because uh, in, in our study, we control, uh, we were only using the tactile and the audio for this particular sort of task. So there's no guarantee that it could be translated into other games as well. But uh, if the, the whole theory about BCI literacy, like uh, how your brain folds, and how the signal is being presented at the surface. If that 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 theory is, is uh, actually valid, maybe uh, 
for a single subject, if his signal is, is classifiable in one task, it's also, it tends to be more classifiable in another task. So that's just my, my idea, yeah. yeah. Are you aware of any work where um, someone tries to decode attention from audio or tactile where there is no spatial separation? Mm. Good question. Because that, that would be a great way yeah. to So there are some studies uh, uh, showing that uh, the, the, the sound is actually not spatialized, but uh, they are different in pitch. So there's a high pitch or low pitch. And in my thesis work, actually, we are working on uh, male and female speakers. So they, they, they also differ in pitch as well. And uh, uh, I don't, so don't, don't know the, the result yet, but uh, there could be some differences in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. For, for the uh, multi-session case, is there a major change in terms of hardware or anything to, to the subjects? I hope not. <laughs> because I remember in my case, the, yeah. uh, it was much less conductive that like we saw the impedance was very high mm -hmm. in the, the second time we did this. So I'm surprised that like, when you train on one day and test on the other, it works at all. Well, uh, and it, it was actually working in some cases, right? Like, <laughs> We're not supposed to disclose <laughs> who you are in the show. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm okay. Um, um, so we're not gonna go back to the chart, but in theory. Uh, yeah. So so. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's all being recorded here. <laughs> Yeah, we, we. I mean, uh, we, we we tried our best to, to guarantee that. that most of those twelve people are here. <laughs> <laughs> so, on a general note, I think one satisfying result from this whole thing was that even when, so the, the interesting, to me at least, the interesting result that the behavioral performance didn't predict the classification means that even if you felt that. You couldn't do the task at all. Like the tactile one for, was was quite difficult for many people. Even if you felt you couldn't do it at all, because you're paying so hard, you're, you're paying so much attention to trying to do it. The signal is actually pretty strong, so you can actually pick up whether you focus on the left or the right. So the the classification task, the rising, falling versus the zigzag thing, that was there just to give. The subject something, something to, to latch to onto do. to do, yes. yeah, right? to do. Yeah. and and the the frequency uh, the frequencies in, uh, in in those were different enough that you know, if you didn't sort of do that you would have seen that distinction anyway. Well, uh, if we don't ask them to respond, is that what you mean? Well, no, you would have, but you would have seen the SS uh, EP. Yeah, um, if they truly pay attention, I think right. so. Okay, I think so, but. Uh, to ask them to, to answer the question is another way to guarantee that they are ready. It remind me, when you picked the frequencies for the, the secondary note and that, was it a harmonic of the other, of the first? Uh, for the vibration or for the sound? Both. For both? Uh, there's no, I, I chose prime numbers. So there shouldn't be any. So when you, when, the, when you go to the second note in that sequence, it's a completely yeah. different, uh, it's an unrelated frequency. Like it's a, it's but a same modulation. Same modulation. Same modulation. Yeah, yeah. All right. And that's the one you actually tried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. Right. Yeah, and just to uh, follow up on your comment, uh, Anis, yeah, it's uh, the fact that even people who could not do the task very well uh, could still have like uh, a specialization as SCP or SS, uh, IEP there. But what about the opposite? So have you also just so in theory, people who could do the task? Normally, they should be a good uh, classification in there. So, I, the, uh, the the opposite makes sense. But is it also the, the case like people who did well the task, they also perform well? Well, uh, if you show yeah, yeah, in the in the the keyboard. So, in the behavior results, uh, way back there. So here, mm -hmm. uh, we have some people who 
whose EEG is classifiable, uh, very high, but yeah. uh, couldn't do the test very well. Yeah, and the opposite. We also have who could, uh, is very, uh, sorry, uh, what's the opposite? <laughs> so people who do very well the task? Uh, yeah, like, like yeah. Do very well here, but uh, I mean, the signal yeah. is also classifiable pretty well. So there is one, there, I get to your question, there is one that, where the classification is around chance, the, 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 the last dot on the right. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. It's around chance, even though their actual task performance was 90, whatever, yeah. 7%. I, I think, think that the, the fact that we have dots at each corner gives us all the combinations we, we, we can speculate. So, yeah, um, yeah. yeah because that, that, and that brings back to the, to the idea of the, of the strategy I was uh, suggesting. So mm -hmm. maybe some people like, have found good strategies to make the difference between right, right and left. But still, it's not like uh, EEG classifier. Yeah, yeah. So, because the strategy with what they modulate their attention, that's what would make uh, the EEG classifier mm -hmm. yeah. so. Apologies if you if you broke this out already, but did, did, did you show what happens when we have the uh, in-ear electrode and the tactile condition just mm -hmm. by itself? Is that this one? The inner electrode and yeah, the tactile, it goes right. a, little, a, a little bit above chance uh, for most of the subjects. Things happen the same I'm trying to square this with um, Nick, Nicholas's talk, mm -hmm. where you know he was struggling to get decent performance in the in your electrode. Mm -hmm. Like, can you compare your results with his? Yeah, we, we can do that offline. <laughs> Uh, but I, think, I guess I guess one one difference is the the task. Like yeah. The task really helps to focus your attention, and so it, it seems that the results bear it out. That when when you, when you force people or you give people something to latch onto, it it also makes their signals stronger or more consistent. I should have done the correlation with the behavior as well for here, right? Just if there's any. Yeah. Uh, Misha? Oh, yeah. Um, so, out of all the sensors that you have on the cap, if I, if I ask you, can you give me five of them that's mm -hmm. best for sound alone, tactile alone, mm -hmm. or mixed, uh, is that some analysis we can do? Yeah, in the feature selection part. Uh, these information could tell us which one contributes more to the classification. Okay. Uh, for example, for for sure we need some sensor at the parietal lobe, okay. the back. or maybe also someone some some sensors at the temporal or like near temporal lobe. So, yeah. This this might also be something that we could potentially look at when we train a neural network and see. The neural network figures out combinations of sensors that maximize performance, so there might be a way to investigate that. And actually, the, the network that, that we used, part of the idea was that it has a very simple structure, so you can theoretically uh, trace back to do exactly that and see which sensors contribute or which features. And uh, when you did the ICA yep. uh, for uh, the processing, mm -hmm. so uh, did you look at what those components were related to? I did. I. So what was like the main component of the ICA? So could you like have an interpretation of it? Uh, for example, for some subjects who has very strong alpha power, yep. it tends to have some components in the parietal lobe. Okay. And uh, some. For example, with a stronger uh, ERP, it should be somewhere in the center. I saw those components also. Okay, so it was not like consistent across subjects again? No. Okay. Yeah. You, you mentioned that in the in ear electrodes, you couldn't do ICA because you didn't have enough sensors. So, uh, do we have something similar for the cap when we don't do ICA? Does the performance drop considerably? to be close enough to the in-ear good, good question. So I started with not using ICA for the surface uh, EEG. Mm -hmm. So I, but since the eye blink is very strong in the EEG, uh, in, in the frontal channels, 
I have to remove the frontal sensors from the classification. And that performance uh, was, is, is lower than adding the ICA back. So it's like around like six to seven percent difference. Yeah. And another suggestion, uh, maybe you should also try uh, at some point to replace ICA with BCA, because maybe what you want is to separate the sources, but maybe take the ones that are most, most of the information. Like, or, or combine both, like you remove the sources, you take only those that are make sense meaningful for, for your study, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. BCA and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds no way. I mean, I didn't do very complicated pre-processing, so I just chose whatever is uh, the state of the art. Is, yeah. All right. If you have no more questions, let's thank Winko once more.